There we go. Okay, that's not better. That should be. It's fine. the second time the charm, and second time is the charm every time on this podcast. All the time. Yeah, we have not at all done that like four times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having flashbacks to episode. Just two. like we never got a post out of order. That's also never happened. Mm-hmm. Yep, definitely. Um, okay. Yeah. And this is a cold open, by the way. This is staying in. <laughs> God damn it. Excellent. Okay. Uh, hello, NeuroPipeliners, and welcome back to Whose Podcast Is It Anyway? The only 90-minute podcast that always delivers you overtime bonus time hours. As we venture into everyone's favorite Japanese colloquialism, it will surely begin to dawn on you just how sticky the miasmatic interwires can get, and you're not sure just... You're not sure how you feel about that, so you decide to stop not cutting to the chase and cut to the point already. Tarbuck, boggle vacantly at these shenanigans. Hi, I'm Fast Talking Craftsman and Indestructible Super God, Tarbuck Transom, your level 3 overseer, the firebrand with inner peace. Your name is Aura Barista, patron saint- oh no, wait, that's me. Patron saint of aestheticians and golden boy of neurotyping, (laughs) haha, get it, golden Aura, us (laughs) band viewers will appreciate that joke. Um, and- uh, with us today, we have the one and only aphantasic new type, lead actress in the critically lauded Gigavlog trilogy and schizoid rap phenomenon, the Carla Dotes Knight. Welcome to the Typeline. Hello, I'm on the podcast. <laughs> Excellent. Um... You should maybe say your new, your new type. Your oh, new oh, type. I mean... Yes, exactly. Say your new type. <laughs> I mean, you already said that I was a new type, but I didn't know if you yep. needed clarifying. They shall figure mm. it out. All right, yeah. Uh, well, and... And I'm Urquoy, the out of breath new type and recent mm. Dotsamite super fan with no time to watch any of her videos. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, then why don't you start us off with talking about the colors of magic? So uh, I, made, I made this post way back, right? When when I was first thinking about neurotyping, when, when it like uh, first kind of exploded. And there were some really obvious connections you can make between like different neurotypes and magic colors. For example, blue really heavily values like really logical thinking and like really, uh, really like multifaceted thinking, right? Mm-hmm. So it would obviously be like a color that prefers ways of thinking that are more lateral and more lexical, right? This is not to say that if you're like a person whose personality type is blue, it doesn't necessarily mean that you like uh, necessarily fit like the human calculator neurotype. But rather the two are probably the types of people you appreciate the most. Then yeah. it comes to like uh, other obvious colors like green and red, where green doesn't really value like uh, lateral thing at all because green is all about your instincts, which which is like a relatively linear thing and also a fairly impressionistic thing because like, green doesn't doesn't really feel the need to civilize everything, so it uh, it's pretty like easily typed. As the uh, as a uh, fucking linear and depressionistic co- color, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the uh, light one makes the most sense to me. Something yeah, the, yeah the white one, the white one makes also a lot of sense. But I also like that. That, mm-hmm. one, that one has the longest explanation. <laughs> I guess so, that, that so one like, and the the fire one. I mean, both make sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've played a little bit of magic before. It seems like you have gotten really into uh, magic. Uh, Oro and uh, do do you got other guys know anything about what these colors are or what they represent? A little bit. I I did play some magic with uh, a quick witted kid I know. He like taught me the rules. Like basically, uh, I only gotcha. played enough games to be like, you know, like okay at it. I didn't really uh, get very deep into what these are, but mm. I know basically what the colors do. Like, uh, I don't know anything. I've had this explained <laughs> to me by two people separately, and I've forgotten all about it each time. I will also now relocate to a different room because, as you can hear, there's a really loud mm. humming behind me now. So, all right, okay. be right back. I mean, I can explain the colors themselves later. Mm-hmm. Like, sh- just just real quick to explain black and red to you. Red yeah. only cares about the impressionistic thought. Red, red doesn't care how later, lateral or linear you are, you are at all. Because mm-hmm. red is just about passion, and uh, it doesn't matter which which type of passion it is, and passion is usually like a really impressionistic thing. Yeah. While uh, while black is just lateral, because black only cares about like how how multifaceted your thought is, kind of. Mm-hmm. Because black black is the color of like. Uh, 
it it's like a kind of the color of like selfishness in in such a way as it relates to self actualization oftentimes mm -hmm. or in a more negative way it's selfish as it relates to like things like psychopathy and so on too mm -hmm. so th this uh, usually means that black likes neurotypes as long as they're lateral it doesn't it doesn't really care if you're like lexical or impressionistic mm -hmm. as long as you can like uh, think yourself into situations i guess yeah and uh, in, in such a way that your favorite black likes you kind of Oh yeah, and if, if for anybody who just refuses to look at the screen during any of these for for whatever reason, um, just a brief rundown of the chart. We have blue in the like dead center on the human calculator. Black is in the middle of the chart and all the way to lateral. Red is in the middle of the chart but all the way to impressionism. Um, white is kind of in the middle of the bottom left quadrant between contemplative, understanding, bookkeeper, and level-headed. And then green is all the way in the bottom right of mm -hmm. pure instinct. That one, that's that's reminding me of the the Zen thing from that Corrado episode. Oh yeah, like oh, Zen, the Corrado Zen the nebula complexity compass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the mess that was that chart. Oh, flashbacks. I guess uh, it's indicative of a good card game that there's uh, none in the middle. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You have to use multiple for, uh, interesting strategies. Yeah. Like, they shouldn't be combinations of each other. Yeah. The, cool. thing with the, uh, the thing with this chart, which which is what, what made it so interesting for me, is that there's a specific color wheel in Magic the Gathering where every color has two friendly colors and two enemy colors, and it has a very distinctive shape. And it just so happened that on this chart uh, of the neurotypes, that shape was completely retained ju just by accident. Oh yeah, it was the Pentagon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can tilt my head and just see a pretty yeah. even uh, oval. That's that's oh, a no. really the cool. Oh no, the chart is an egg again. Know. Say again. The chart is an egg again. <laughs> the chart is an egg again. <laughs> <laughs> it's always an egg. <laughs> and it hatches into your tism. Yeah. <laughs> the, the the thing with white why it requires a long explanation is if you have like the most by the books reading of white right you mm -hmm. would put it like straight in bookkeeper mm -hmm. because that, that's mm -hmm. kind of all that white embodies it's like uh, sticking to the letter of the law right uh, caring about like your group or your state or whatever right so it's okay um it's, i don't know anything about magic but i've seen magic cards white is a lot about knights and shit right yeah white's about knights and shit a lot. okay mm -hmm. yeah so it, a surface level reading would put white would put white in bookkeeper. However, I I don't think that's really a fair reading of white because every color is very multifaceted, right? Yeah, you can get heroes and villains in in every category here. Yeah. So just because the black has the skull on it doesn't mean that it doesn't also have like good people in it, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the colors are kind of like, like, like I really like how you put a, a focus on in your explanation of, the, of this chart here that it's about describing the averages of these things because the colors themselves are about describing like whole civilizations and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's not even average. It's it's just what you value, right? You don't have to be something to value something. And this mm -hmm. this is what I stress every time we explain like this this specific chart is that the, you you can you can be a pure instinct person, right? And have a blue personality. Mm -hmm. But what's mm -hmm. it, what it means is that even though you're pure instinct, what you value in people is often like a really latter and lexical approach to life, even though that's not the approach you have. Mm. Yeah, that's a bit of the kind of we also had with Corrado. Like, um, the ideologies and such of people don't have to reflect their type. Like, what they value in the world doesn't have to be what they themselves embody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah like, with, with white, White is also about uh, understanding like people in in all of the ways that you can understand people, right? It, it's it's not just about like this like brutal type of like collectivism. It's it's about understanding the needs of a population and uh, how how to deal with those as much as it is about like loyalty to a specific organizational regime. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so you're branching out like just enough to like uh, get a read on everything else in a way. Yeah. Uh, let's see, fan nuance take. Here on the timeline, we'll even defend the whites. <laughs> I like that this that this puts me 
as an overseer, like directly between black and red, because I feel like those colors <clears throat> in magic really appeal to me a lot. Uh, yeah. This this kind of thing is going to be harder for you people who have not played the game <laughs> uh, to to not know what the what the theories behind them are. But like if you combine black and red, a lot of times you get like hedonism because you have like the cutthroat selfishness of black and the like uh, sensation and passion of red together. Like th like they were all designed mm. to be very archetypical. So just by saying the color, you can kind of basically get it get the idea of it um interesting the the color system is really well designed um you could you could do a whole podcast of, like this about the color system of magic and the different combinations and stuff like that it's a it's it's it seems simple only on the surface i assumed you'd get inferno cop if you combine red and black <laughs> <laughs> or ghost rider for for the homestuck fans magic color like theory is kind of comparable to like classic like uh, hypothesis and stuff. Uh, that would probably have come up before this episode if you're listening to that. There will probably be a class betting lecture on this very channel. Oh, so that's cool. Look out for that. That's cool. I mean, I mean, oh, the, are the, you the first one? Are you hmm. republishing that? Oh yeah, I'm redoing that and doing it better. <laughs> okay. Um, no, you're doing it yeah. for the first time really well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we have never fucked up on this show. We've already told you. <laughs> this doesn't happen. We have an immaculate record. And what it what it really is 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 my um getting things right the first time uh right. is, is like seeping out of me and into the rest of the people. Like Melkor just just pouring his essence out into the land. It's not that we do things wrong. We're just also really good at historical revisionism. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I also like how this plays into um, something we said before, which is just uh, red is fire. Like, hard, pressy column is just fire imagery. Mm -hmm. They burn constantly. That's how it works. Yeah, that works. That works really well. So pure instinct is the sun on the trees. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you uh, ready to loop up to the next, uh, to the uh, top of this, oh top of the chart, or uh, top of the list? for Not the chair posts oh yeah right you had a you had a ton of notes for this one um, oh yeah i yeah oh, last night okay, yeah. i just uh i just went through the whole video just uh okay we're talking about uh digi's appearance on the dick show talking about neurotyping carla did you mm. ever see this yeah i've seen it okay. the apology to kiwi chris and digi bro and neurotype charts and just off the top, when when somebody's like following this link through and watching this video, uh, if you be prepared, if you are not aware of what the Dick Show is like, because it, it like the Digi portion doesn't start for like five minutes, and uh, that first five minutes can be a little rough if you're not used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, everybody screaming. Even the Digi part Skype has calls. a lot of weird drama in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, also if you have the note doc open. You will see that Yoko wrote out like one and a half pages of notes. Uh, yeah, whoops. Okay. Uh, I don't even remember most of this. It's a very heat of the <laughs> what? moment. Didn't you write this yesterday? <laughs> yeah, that's part of why I don't remember it, because I wrote it in like, as I was writing the video, so it's like in an hour. Um, mm. Let's see. Okay, I, I really like how everyone keeps convincing sean of being hard impressionist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that sure is a mood like digi um explicitly tells him like oh no you know, this is all learned lexical behavior you do this and this but the way of interacting is all different mm. and there is this pride that i feel from sean and like no i i have i have molded myself around these modes i have succeeded i have gotten good at this and he does not want to accept that he is secretly a pressy and that's relatable mm -hmm. that's nice i <laughs> they keep coming back to it if you watch the video portion of it when they're talking to him about what Im an impressionist is and how it works you see this like dawning look of realization <laughs> yes. as he's like taking stock of himself <laughs> <laughs> that was the guy in the institution right yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had something on that. Oh yeah, the I like precise words and I search for them. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, I really want to be able to just like yes. have this giant vocabulary of like exactly 
what I mean for like all different situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It also um, fits into Digi's uh, description of her dad, where she was like, yeah, he just is really fascinated with how something can be lexicalized in a really clear way. That's why he reads books. Mm-hmm. And also the the sort of like feeling stupid thing for like not being able to mm. explain. I also relate to that a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you all think about the take that all millennials now is charge their phone and be lexical? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do kind of have to agree, but in, in a bigger way than just that, mm. I don't think it's just millennials who worship lexicality um, although the generations further further on seem to have been like partly cured of this it's like it's like humanity is recovering <clears throat> i think it actually came from the cold war because um uh, nato and the soviet union were like in a science war against each other trying to outscience each other and so there was a really hard push in a, in the united states at least for um lots and lots of math and science education for a really long time and like the only thing that is valid and valuable is this the stem way of thinking about things and hmm. you get uh, the the further away from that we get in time the less the if you feel the effects of that like hard push even though it was way back in the 60s we're still dealing with the echoes and the fallout of all of that today mm-hmm yeah, I think it's a it's a question of framing. When I first heard that, I was like, hmm, that doesn't sound like right. It seems like uh, society has moved in a more and a post structuralist direction, I guess. But even then, like the way that is codified and conveyed through the culture is again through harsh categorization. Well, I think this like even when we try to break down categories, we do it in a really structured way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I enjoy myself a good uh, millennial breakdown videos of things. <laughs> I, uh, I would actually say that the movement towards lexicality isn't isn't the recent phenomenon. I think it's, I think it's something that started like all the way back in like classical thought. It's the enlightenment. Just, oh, okay. No, no, not even the enlightenment. The uh, like uh, the real thing that Enlightenment did, in in my opinion, when it comes to, like this specific issue at least, is it brought the sense of lexicality to like a uh, more significant cultural position. But mm-hmm. but it's always kind of been like that. The, that the most important people in in a culture, right, also tend to be like the most lexical people in in a lot of ways. Like not always, but like yeah. very often. And mm-hmm. uh, as as time has gone on, right, since uh, pe- people often want to like have have that sort of importance and status uh, they they intentionally like put themselves in in more lexical frames of mind and appre- appreciate that way of thinking more or that's, mm. that's at least my take yeah pretty much society went downhill when we stopped appreciating shamans <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> time cake would be proud <laughs> he would there is i i think that that effect has definitely been magnified by the fact that writing books and having a, an ancient book around that you can reference back to is just more likely to happen if you're a lexical rather than an impressionistic person. And so it tends to be the lexical thoughts that stick around in a an officially recognized capacity. Yeah, like we gave the Katagagos the keys to history. Yeah kind of like yeah, like the yeah. the categorical side got literature and the impressionistic side got oral tradition and like you can probably feel in oh, yourself it's, it's right like now that code book madness and society <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, you can probably Hell like yeah. listeners can probably feel in themselves right now uh, like a a programmed into them snarl at the concept of oral tradition or like person to person history and, and stories and and that kind of thing handed down and you should you should investigate that because that's like that is an unfair bias against one of the primary modes of human communication yeah yeah as this idea that there is a a language 
of insanity, which is more of a silence than anything else. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, a lot of deep insight has been lost because we just have uh, the quote-unquote sane uh, dictating narrative and speaking about mm. and uh, through the insane, um, casting them away so we cannot directly observe the behavior and not giving them a voice to um, yeah, have a different insight into the mind. Uh, which I assume everyone listening to this is mentally ill in some way, so <laughs> I'm sure we all can relate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's why that's why the bottom left quadrant is called normies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone who is not listening to this show is a bookkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the test. If you're not listening that's to this show, you're a bookkeeper. Congratulations, you found out your right. neurotype. <laughs> right, that's where they all went. <laughs> You're also a life player. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to nod along and pretend I know what that means. Wait, right. life and light. Wait, or white. No, life players would listen to this show. Life. <laughs> okay. And the color white is what I meant oh, to okay. say. Yeah. Right. So in this video, they they uh, digi discusses a couple of her thoughts on like what linearity is in a in a way that she hadn't quite clarified uh, or like like she wasn't as clear about what linearity is in the past and there's been a couple of people in previous episodes who have complained about that kind of thing <laughs> but uh here i feel totally vindicated by history because like look linearity is what i said it was basically uh, a direct quote from her what is um if you're watching a movie and somebody starts talking you have to tell them to shush because you can't concentrate on more than one thing at once you can't concentrate on the movie and reality at the same time like like you're hmm. you're like you're easy to derail right right and and it's hard to I get mean, i feel like that take has been done before in life in the spiral a bit mm -hmm. like this is again kind of multitasking yeah. But, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, but um, it, it's yeah. it's different being told it from the perspective of a linear person. Right. Like the one one of my theories uh for a while was that like it, as a more lateral person, if I get interrupted on something, I can put it I I have I have I can hold my thought in one hand and then do something with the other hand and then come back to the thought that's in my one hand. But if you are as as you get more more and more linear, you just can't hold that many uh, things in the background, and so you have to like go and pick them up where you dropped them, you know. And that's that gets harder and harder the more mm -hmm. linear you get. Well, it's sort mm -hmm. of like this divisibility of attention, I think. Like, um, mm -hmm. I think even if you know, say I'm watching a movie and somebody does start talking to me, I can't necessarily like, I can't fully focus on either of them, but I can like. I can do like just enough. I can, you know, f focus enough on the conversation and keep track of like the important bits of the movie. Like if mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep track of both, but I don't think you can actually focus on two things at once. Like not in the same way that you could on one thing. Uh, some people can do it. Probably. I, I think it's, I mean, it's over talked sure. about. Uh, I assume like the people who seem like, they can focus on two things at once as well as on one thing are just never doing one thing. They're always doing that thing you perceive them doing and then also thinking about something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when they noticeably really think about two things, it's the same as when they noticeably really think about one. And the more lateral you get, I feel like you have an easier time finding your footing again when you pick up a thread sure, that you yeah. had previously dropped. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, th I think of it as like, I don't know, you have like more like smaller tiny brain eels or something and you can like <laughs> attach these to different things so you can have like a few on one thing and a few on another and you know you can keep splitting this up but eventually it will run out yeah um yeah. but yeah i think that does that helps with the multitasking thing um I also like the little idea on uh, dating and who you find sympathetic. We've talked about this a little bit before, and that people tend to um, appreciate people mirrored on the lexicality impressionism mm -hmm. axis. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea that Digi explicitly said that, oh, so essentially you want to be a mid-type on that axis to actually engage in society, 
And so you look for a partner who either gives you more lexicality or more impressionism, just so you can together be one functional person. <laughs> right. And and Dick drops the quote, nobody wants to date themselves, which right. like... of course. I mean, it's literally untrue. Like, uh, and... Is it? As far as I've looked into it, it seems like you might be like fascinated by and attracted to people who are very different from you uh, in terms of like mm. interests or the way that you think about things or something like that. But the like stable long term relationships tend to be people who are as close to being like you as possible. I hmm. uh, somebody I showed me data on this, true. but it was like three years ago. So good luck to mm. future me trying to find the link. Uh, <laughs> possibly link in the description. Who knows? It's it's on screen, maybe. Or at least there's text on screen telling you whether we found it or not. Because <laughs> I have a tendency to talk about these things and then not actually be able to find them later. <laughs> it always seems like people who try to convince you that they would want to date themselves have a horribly skewed perception of themselves. And actually mm. don't want to date themselves at all. They want to date an idealized image of themselves. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess once you get past those like first stages of a relationship, you get to the part where you need to start uh, being like functional about it as a as a thoroughly entangled person most people don't get past the the first stages of a relationship in my experience most people just like uh get through the first part or get to the end of the first part and then their relationship fizzles out or they like stagnate as a person or or all kinds of what i'm saying is that most people uh get into relationships and then fail at them and then break up that's what happens <laughs> Right. Mm, sure. <laughs> uh, your daily dose of judgment coming from Tarbuck I mean, no. It, most people fail, period. I don't <laughs> think that's all trick. <laughs> I, I think there's more more to, uh, you know, people that you can relate to than just the neurotype. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if we're restricting I mean, there's something the... to it, but... If we're restricting the conversation to only neurotyping, uh, I don't know. I haven't been in like 10 relationships since discovering neurotyping, so uh, <laughs> I'll do some more research and report back to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, a a Tabak's gonna date um, 16 people, one of every neurotype, till next episode, and then relay his experience. <laughs> well, well, in order to get a real good sample size, I would want like, let's see. Are you gonna date the audience? Any two points make a line, so you have to have a minimum of three people, yeah, right. four for safety. Write a comment if you want to date Tabak. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a good way of organizing. That's four times 16, 64 people need to date me? Okay. Hmm. Uh, that's Maybe... that's enough research for a lifetime. I th I think uh, I think my by the end of that, I'll I'll be catching up to Ben Saint, if you know what I mean. I, I, I think you have your weekend cut out. Mm hmm We'll just carve out the next episode and have it be like a big uh, e-date with Starbuck. <laughs> <laughs> it will be yes. nothing but atonal moaning. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so uh, there's another quote in here that uh, perfectly encapsulates exactly how I always thought Digi thought of these things, which is, if you think in terms of rules and knowledge that has that already exists, you have no imagination. <laughs> Digi yeah. is supremely anti lexicality. Wow. Which, I mean, which is like yeah. the point of the chart. Right. And it's also kind of been the point of Digi's videos from the start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the point of her career. Yeah. And that's why some of the shakier things that she says, like um like it claims that she makes that i don't really agree with i like i get that she's not saying the the like literal meaning of the things that she's saying you know like mm -hmm. there will be a couple of times where she'll like orbit a topic and then rephrase it a couple of times even within this episode that we're talking about um yeah where by the end of it uh a a very lexical person might think that that she's contradicted herself when she just hasn't that's just like different ways of failing to express the uh the, the core idea there mm -hmm. hmm. I'm, i th I noticed this a lot like way before the neurotyping video like i just i just would understand pretty much anything she said even mm -hmm. if i didn't agree with it i'd like get the idea i mean um that's maybe another thing to note like dick is really quick on the uptake on all yeah. of this yeah definitely um and specifically, like, his read on neurotyping 
sounds a lot like uh, Read Me, Roman Romantics. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Nobody else. That's something to note. It, yeah, it's good that it wasn't a frustrating, no, you're not understanding this. Let's explain it again. Yeah. It's pretty much... I mean, I think... Only minor misunderstandings to be ironed out. A lot of that has to do with the, like, neurotyping itself being, like, really easy to get. Mm. Like, Especially you mentioned if, that like, compared you... to, like, MBTI, like, trying to learn all these, like, functions and, like, getting confused about, like, what they are, like, mixing two of them up or, you know, you don't really have any of that with this. It's mm-hmm. just like, yep, this is what you got, like, two axes. Like, you could memorize the names of the, of all the neurotypes, and we have, but you don't have to in order to function in a conversation about the chart. Like, um, you, you, you could probably... This, like, it's some monumental achievement. <laughs> <laughs> we have memorized 16 terms. I mean, when you're presenting this from scratch to somebody, here, memorize these 16 terms. That is kind of a lot to ask of somebody in a, in a short sure. period of time, like the way that Digi is presenting the uh, neurotyping to Dick and company. And hmm. like the, the having just fewer term, terms around the core ideas and focusing on those makes it, makes it go down a lot easier, you know? Right. A mm-hmm. um, couple of other insights. Um, it's very, very clear that when when she says normie, she doesn't literally mean like the average of people. She means it like a slur, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, As everyone should. Yes, exactly. Uh, I am uh, on board with hating on normies, 100%. Right. We, we've all seen the no thank you, uh, what are normies video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's in the video description. Watch that. Yes, uh, you are a, a piece of paper in the bottom left corner, and you get more interesting as it goes outwards in any direction. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Um, lexicality is literal is literalness confirmed. Um, mm-hmm. Bookkeepers are stated here to be unadaptable, like they can't see past their own preconceived notions that they went into a situation with or have a harder time coping with things not being the way that they thought in advance like like you need mm, a yeah that's and that's our kind of arc in psychopaths that makes mm-hmm. sense yeah um uh, all the discussion that they had to sean about um learning how to overcome the limitations of being really far to one side or something like that you like different mm. ways to engage with different modes of yeah that, that you right. had to learn like really everyone get... must learn to function like a normal person and it's just mm-hmm. you tend to develop this um idea that oh this this was a hard thing for me to grasp but that people must have put in that work like no that literally happened just you, you start with a different skill set mm-hmm. uh, and you have to learn the rest yeah and that really lends a lot of credence to my theory that all the different axes are actually pairs of skills <laughs> hmm. let's see um Oh, I, I want to quickly clarify something, yeah. because this has come up in discussion of this podcast. I'm like, really clear. Like, we'll go through these neurotyping posts chronologically. We'll talk about them. We have to discuss them, because if we don't discuss them, we won't actually figure out, like, where these tendencies lead. We have to ask questions, discuss what the post means. And mm-hmm. we'll have takes about them. We'll state our opinions. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean that we think that this is what has been developed at this point. Uh, that isn't the point of the show. We just, there's no point in us trying to feign some objectivity here. We'll just say what we think about posts. You can make your own opinion. Um, I'm sure if you can't, then this is literally worthless. Yeah, like, I'm always saying the things that I think are true, but you do not have to agree with me. Like, form yeah. your own conclusions. That's why we're being so thorough in going uh, over everything is... If there's something that I've thought about or like some insight that I've gleaned, like uh, the next thing that I have highlighted here is laterality is dissociation. Uh, We're going to have a conversation about that. And like, if you disagree with me, well, at least I gave you the prompt so you didn't have to do research yourself. You could just like sit back and let it wash over you, bud. Right. There's a reason why we still talk about the posts we think are bad. Because (laughs) you might not. You might glean something from Mm -hmm. them. And we hope that our calling them bad and criticizing them might even further that or maybe it doesn't but hey we told you about it 
I would really um, like to be convinced at some point that a post that I've hated on actually has more merit than I was giving it because it means that I learned something. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, mm. uh, yeah, that was the quick interlude about what the show even is. Yeah. What do you I think of... I thought uh, that was obvious, but apparently it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of laterality as dissociation? Mm. Uh, I feel like we've talked about that before. <laughs> yeah, I kind of agree with that. Like having the self outside the body. And mm. such. Like We've talked about it... Oh, we've talked about it in the dysphoria context. Uh, it would be easier for you to feel dysphoria if you already are used to interacting with yourself as a being outside yourself. Mm. Carla, what do you think about that? Uh, I, I was just trying to get my thoughts in order. I, I think it's vaguely right. However, I think like the context in which laterality is uh, disassociation uh, varies a lot depending on whether a person is lexical or impressionistic. Hmm. Like I, th I think for impressionistic people, it's it's basically just like straightforwardly forwardly true that uh, laterality is dissociation. But uh, wait. I'm, I'm I'm losing my train of thought. Anyway, but like for for lexical people, it's it's a completely different form of dissociation, right? If it makes any sense. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. like, what does lexical dissociation look like to you? Uh, like for for me, like uh, impressionistic dissociation is more like the uh, like removal of one's self from like the perceived self or the uh, physical self, but like for mm. For like lexical lexicality and laterality, I think those intersect as, as in more like dissociation from what is generally recognized by society as like uh, the the way to interact with other people, kinda. Hmm. Hmm. So if I've got it right, then it seems like like the highly linear lateral, the highly lateral, and the highly impressionistic, like the new type type of um dissociation is like almost like losing focus on yourself as an observer whereas hmm. if you are dissociating in any human calculator kind of way you are you're like you're losing focus of the thing that you're looking at but you still feel like an observer of things does that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's kind of a difference between like the image blurring like you literally lose focus on a camera to you switch to a different angle to a different camera yeah hmm. that's not it. so like not soft sure. focus versus um multiplying the number of perspectives on something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Or, yeah or my favorite that's, soft, that's a cool image my favorite yeah. version of soft focus is like those really cool depth of field shots like like taking a picture from a helicopter and then making the the close and far parts of it blurry so that it looks like a toy set but it's a real photograph mm. huh. yeah. yeah that's my new that's my new explanation for the different kinds of um the top corners yeah yeah i like it mm. it's really cool and also um i'm sad we don't have tolly here to elaborate on that mm. i like the idea of a human calculator just Essentially sitting in one of these surveillance rooms with a bunch of different monitors, which are different perspectives of themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a scene from the second Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes movie that I think connects to that pretty well, where you have um, Sherlock Holmes just sitting in a restaurant and he's just like paying attention to everything everywhere. And mm. it, it's zooming in on, on this detail of somebody's wrist and this person's shoes and this one line that this one person is saying and he he just looks like he's having a hard time because he has to go down every train of thought and he has like there's when he doesn't have anything to focus on he focuses on everything hmm. was that the like 2010 ish one uh it has iron man in it oh yeah that's the one i've seen okay i don't remember that scene though yeah, um, there was two of them, and I'm talking about the second one. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, here, I remember. Let's see. Wasn't that the first one? That happened um, in the first one. He's, like, sitting in the restaurant. I don't think so. Yeah, it was. I, 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 the first one. I watched these in theaters because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I think I watched the second one in theaters. Hmm. But, yeah. Um. 
Guess mm. what? Guess what it's time what? for? Oh, well, I have one too. Mm. Okay, hey, Carla, I you have a cold have drink you want to crack into the microphone with us? No. Uh, I guess I could open the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> that works. You ready? Okay, wait a sec. <laughs> <laughs> There's this little nugget of an idea that has nothing to do with neurotyping, but it struck me from this episode, which is anybody in society is the most upset about the people who crossed the line that they wish they could have crossed themselves. Mm. And I just like thinking about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. It, it has nothing to do with neurotyping, but, but here we are. All right. But Ready to go? Yeah. Who knows? Three, two, one. Yeah. Sort of. Okay. Broke the seal early on mine. Good stuff. Yeah, we crack cans and we crack the mysteries of neurotyping. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, oh, I really like how neurotyping is introduced in this thing as, uh, um, as horoscopes for men. <laughs> <laughs> horoscopes for men, or zodiacs for men, or or something like that. And uh, <sighs> being Dick, he means it in a in a very positive way, right. even he though he's being overtly misogynistic. <laughs> That's kind of like the opposite take of the uh, PCP episode on mm-hmm. neurotyping. Yeah. Yeah. What does everybody think of um, the the dick description often, or uh, dick, wait, no, often mm-hmm. right, rarely correct. We've talked about that in the past, haven't we? Oh, uh, the, yeah. The Maddox yeah. thing. Right. I don't um, know anything about this dude. Um. There's a... There's a long lecture you could watch if you really care, but don't. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> you, you could also just listen to The Biggest Problem. It's a good show. It <laughs> remains a good show. I trust your judgment. I will actually go ahead and go with that. Uh, oh, it's actually been... Okay. Um, It's been a year and a half. I think I can still probably say that pretty confidently. Yeah. Hmm. I'm looking at at uh Urquois notes here and like there's this there's this narrative that's being woven here of like <laughs> you slowly coming to like, be, like judgment over digi <laughs> you want to talk about that uh wait what are you talking about exactly <clears throat> oh those well, yeah like like in in this section that i'm highlighting right here the way animals yeah there's like Digi at this point um, uh, thought of herself as an analyst, but there's <laughs> there's all these things that are uh, pointing to the impressionism. And here, um, I forget which episode we talked about, but it was it was the one about the way um, people on Reddit write posts, like the different types. And uh, Tarbuck said that purple is like anecdotes was a better description of that. Yeah. And here, like, we have an anecdote. Like, she begins talking about impressionism with, okay, so the way animals think is that they uh, they just follow their instincts. They don't... Um, <laughs> yeah, they understand things through the perceptions they've picked up over time. So it's like, mm-hmm. I guess that enti- ties into the implicit learning from uh, John Romero or whatever the f- whatever his name is. <laughs> But yeah, the, th- throughout this whole thing I wrote, there's like maybe like four times that I noticed they are like really obviously uh, purplish things that she said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pretty funny. I mean, in other <laughs> contexts, she has explicitly credited neurotyping and her exploration of it with why she realized she was trans. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I do remember at least one thing about that. Um, I'm done with my notes. Do you have any more? I'm set. Yeah, okay. I can, I can barely on. understand my spaghetti, so. Um, scroy, lateral thinking. Scroy. All right, that's, uh, there's that post for Carla. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not the biggest fan. Okay, we have a series of diagrams. The first is, like, two, um trees of nodes like the middle is apparently the mind and it goes off as um multiple nodes connected to it flowing into that middle one uh two of them are for sound two are for visuals two are for narratives and they describe the process of watching a show 
then there's flow off from the central mind node to red colored nodes um, described as distracted by thoughts. I don't like this one because what the fuck is the purpose of you watching a show if you don't want to have thoughts about it? Yeah, what? yeah. having thoughts about what you're watching is just like right, the essential yeah. experience of watching something. Right. I mean, I guess, but, but well, don't, a lot don't of the time, off, kids. I will, I don't think it's turning your brain off necessarily. Like I'll be watching a show or something and something in it reminds me of something else. And then I start like thinking about other stuff and then I can't stop. It's like distracting me. That, I think that's mm. what this is. Maybe. That's why there's a rewind 10 seconds button. <laughs> <laughs> I do this in podcasts. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd usually like just driving I'd, or something. And I just like stop what I'm watching. And, like think about that. I mean, but <clears throat> so, some good old rhizomatic thinking kicked off by media is usually a good thing in my mind. So, mm. Mm. Uh, yes, rhizomatic. It's definitely weird to me that the the flow state diagram for playing games in which this uh, flow off is satiated by physical activity. Um, so it's all closed, all flows into mind, and I don't know what mind does. It doesn't seem like anything much happens, but there's no thing for thought. So that's. That doesn't sound like a productive good flow state. Well, I mean, you'll complete the game, but what does that serve you? Um, <laughs> to give this person say... the benefit of the doubt, I think that what's what's going on here, when it's red, I think that means, like, things you don't want to be thinking about, like your laundry yeah, or, the there was, or something. Yeah, there was and another one I, further down. So that means that would mean that what they're saying here is that playing games is more engaging because it requires it basically takes your full attention or as much of it I, your attention I as you can get Get that yeah that's kind of the point i was getting to is that um it's very much seems like scry is pretty much just putting natural thinking as adhd here <laughs> <laughs> it's just oh. i mean maybe uh, he has adhd i wonder you need uh you need some stimulus toy or you'll be distracted <laughs> <laughs> all right the, the next image that goes with it is like one tree that's lexical where you have two nodes both labeled podcast and flow going to the mind and one node labeled song and flow going to the mind and then if you go over to the impressionistic side you have podcast which has three nodes <coughs> and like some red ominous text in the background that go, <laughs> parsing words and some flow <laughs> going towards the person and then with a song, you have like a nice happy blue that says full appreciation and flow is yeah, going from there to the mind. Uh, full appreciation. Showing you that since, since songs there's are no better. counter example for any of these, I would assume this just means that impressionists think about more things or think <laughs> more intensely about things. There was a, a much more recent post. This wasn't even on the Reddit, I don't think. It was just like some explanation but like the way he divides like uh lexical and impressionist is like impressionist is like big chunks of like um i don't know like big rock with like ore in it you could say and then lexical mm. is like those pieces of ore like already taken out so yeah he thinks of lexical thoughts as like bigger like uh nebulous chunks of things that could contain any random type thing. So I think that's why he's like making these into like bigger pieces. Mm -hmm. It's like a song is like making him think of more stuff like tangentially related, I guess. That's sort I can of like see sticky to it. Mm. Yeah. I don't like the full appreciation of the song thing. That's like, right, it's yeah. just a hilarious uh, songs are better than podcasts because you can <laughs> fully appreciate them that's what they're saying right because songs don't have words <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> because songs don't have words well some don't <laughs> that's yes that's the joke <laughs> uh, a lot of them do actually it's it's horrible but it's true <laughs> maybe he um, likes ambient music oh well uh, next chart, it's, it's again our brain node, but all of the peripheral nodes going off it are interconnected. Well, some of them are interconnected. Like, it's it's a sprawling little network out there. And then there's an outer boundary, which is red with a lot of X's and arrows coming around. Angry, big old red arrows coming from the outside. It says deep in thought. 
in the cons, Croy elaborates that it's just, uh, oh, so you, you, yeah, you're thinking about shit and thoughts interconnect to other thoughts and you're deep in thought, so what else is out there doesn't affect you. You're shutting off the outside world, which, yeah, that's what thinking is. Again, you all sound <laughs> not like lateral thinking. These all just sound like thinking and maybe a bit of ADHD. <laughs> This is a thing you can do, like, last night when I was pacing around my kitchen thinking about class picting. Like, <laughs> I was fully focused on it. It's a thing you can do. You should try it sometime. Yeah. Yeah, well, the uh, the thanks. shape of the graph around, around like, like the trees with the loops and all of that, it, it seems like lateral thought to me. But right. the the whole idea of having like this red barrier that's preventing other outside thoughts from interfering, that's just like focus. Right, yeah, man. that seems so, right. Uh, yeah, the chant itself that seems like um like time cakes, little thought mazes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that looks like one of the naturality graphs. But it's like a the bootleg. idea it conveys bootleg. is entirely natural. I wonder if you could rearrange this into a shape that you might recognize from from Kabbalah, like the Tree of Life or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I was gonna say like, oh, you can see like, um, oh no, the, these aren't binary divisions. I back in the I was gonna mm -hmm. say, oh, this is aberrant thinking as opposed to rhizomatic thinking, which is bad from the start, <laughs> which doesn't sound like. Uh, well, it doesn't fucking matter. Who cares? Um, <laughs> not a tangent. I'm gonna go on. <laughs> There's a couple of other illustrations of like, um, "Hey man, what's up?" And you think of like a bunch of different things, and maybe some yeah, of dialogue them, like, boxes yeah. pop up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which one do you choose? <laughs> the ceiling. Yes. As someone who is categorically immune to social anxiety, can somebody who has social anxiety confirm this chart at the at the end here, where like? There's like three nodes that are all red with X's through them. They're labeled people. Right. I mean, oh, I uh, was assuming this is a hit list. <laughs> <laughs> so as long that's, as there's two that's people way left better. on the planet Earth, um, someone's going to win. Someone dead. Um, I'm assuming the point is that these other things are the things that thinking about that spiral off from the social interaction, they're no longer actually listening to what the people are saying. That's my interpretation of it. I think, this, you know. I mean, similar to the, you said the the one at the top could be like things you don't want to think about. Um, to mm. me, uh, with social anxiety, um, it's sort of like the presence of people is like taking up your cognition. Like um, mm. they're just around you and you're like, having to be ready to like deal with them in some way you're like thinking okay what are they going to ask me what are they going to want from me mm -hmm. um stuff yeah. like that so i think this is accurate and it's like just harder to think yeah but again like this doesn't seem like a naturality thing maybe not at all <laughs> right you know on the on the focus thing the idea of like being able to shut out sensation from the world and just focus on what you're thinking about where somebody can't get your attention or something i really wish i could switch that on and off that would be cool hmm sure yeah sure not while you're driving though <laughs> i mean I, I, i've seen graphs like this like collections of oh he's a, a, a flow chart representing a social interaction that's kind of nice and simplified and mamey on tumblr and such before and right. they're all really universally applicable, and it seems the same way for this. Like, nothing of this screams laterality to me. Mm -hmm. Some things that can happen in your brain. Yeah. So, uh... Hey, um, have you heard about thinking? It's it's a very lateral <laughs> thing. You probably know what I meant. <laughs> uh, it's Roman. very cutting edge. All the kids are doing it. <laughs> yeah. Roman, can you confirm, do you think or not? <laughs> I mean, he would just say, yeah, I don't think that's yeah. a thing he would say, but... <laughs> no, no, he's of the opinion that he thinks soft or laterals think hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and his pee, pee is hard and our pee, -pee is soft. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Tragic. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> no, no, it's it's not PG stat graph. Both can be both can be hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that sounds more like Dude. one of my thoughts. Sure. Yeah. Do I have to sacrifice uh, something? Do I, can I get a balanced like 
Well, if you sacrifice someone, maybe. Oh, yeah, sure. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm good to go on to the next one if you are. Okay. Um, Aunt Eater Penis 7. (laughs) Three axes in your (laughs) chart. The total seriousness with which you tried to say that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Aunt Eater Peener. I mean, and I would have gotten away with it if you hadn't laughed. <laughs> I'm not going to laugh. Uh, well, they got the reading of their name they deserve. Yeah, like, this isn't this isn't much of a theory post. This is just a 3D neuro heat map, um, neuro mm-hmm. tendency chart, which also adds the temperament, which goes from relaxed to intense in Digi's original videos. And um, I just included this post because... That hasn't come up at all. Yes, this is, I think this like is the first mention anywhere. Nobody cared about temperament. Mm-hmm. So let's fucking talk about temperament then. I mean, uh, temperament wasn't like a part of the neurotyping theory. It was just a way for DG to illustrate why neurotypes can behave differently. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's exactly the note I have here, mm-hmm. which is that this seems like an exclusionary thing, much like intelligent, like... She explicitly made them separate things on the chart so that people wouldn't think they're part of the other axis. Mm. Axes. Yeah. Because, like, lexicality could be impre- um, done as being smart and kind of impressionism. There's a lot of hot headed people on that side. Mm. So you might think, oh, it's just aggressive types. So by saying, by adding that separately, you can explicitly say that oh no these this isn't what it means yeah um yeah no that's exactly my take also it's kind of like having a memes channel in your discord the point of having a memes channel is so that you can tell people not to post memes in every channel Hmm. yeah exactly yeah um i do it anyway i'm i'm like softly interested as to whether you think being relaxed or intense is better even though it has nothing Uh, to do with neurotyping i don't know Intent. The I answer don't is intent. I think either is better necessarily. I think you can just. I do. I think you work is better. better in one of the states. Uh, <laughs> I'm definitely usually more interested in intense people. <laughs> <laughs> That's the stuff. Yeah, you like uh, you like those thieves, don't you? Uh, yes, mm-hmm. I, I like. Um, <laughs> yes. Confirmed thief like a aura. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I like that at least one other person remembered that th- the temperament existed and then we can all just scrub it from our collective memory after commenting on it this one time. Like yeah, it, right. it really doesn't matter. Like it's obvious. You know what these means. It's yeah. not worth talking about. Yeah, you might like and it's it's so unrelated. You might as well put healthy and stressed as a separate axis. Like you could just yeah. keep adding axes, but it doesn't mean that it but all goes together. Likes oranges. Yeah. It's, yes. It's just one of a billion things you can chuck onto the neuro chart, which I do like, but yeah. it doesn't weave into the these two axes the the I've way that they weave into each other. Yeah. The but thir- like the third axis. A very is... nice little three D animated thing of the chart. So. The, the third cool. axis is apples to oranges. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. How is it apples to oranges? No, no. Th- that's what the axes are. On one side you have apples and on the other side you have oranges. <laughs> yeah. But what do you um, have in the middle? Plums. Duh. They don't want you to know. <laughs> the plums are kind of sour, but they also have like a like a meaty flesh that's not fibery. Plums go in well, the middle. That could be a nectarine. I don't know. A lot of... <laughs> or peaches. I would also accept peaches. <laughs> I guess those are all. No, the same no. Peaches thing. are really more like on the apple side. I'm now rating all all fruit on a spectrum from apples to oranges. I, I don't like that the kernels get bigger in the middle. I think we kernel just size made up an stay axis consistent that are among the spectrum. Wasting time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, this is stupid. <laughs> this is stupid. Um, Let's move on. Yeah, put up a this is stupid gif. <laughs> Time, ca- yes, it, it's already on screen. Do you really think I would have said that or not put that on screen? <laughs> Fool. All right. Um, Time cake. Emergence <clears throat> of the flow structure through the neurotype charts. This Boy. is one of the first, so, uh, like, alternate neuro charts that I've ever seen. Like, yeah. Like, way back in the day, when I just clicked on the subreddit, finally, this was what I was greeted with. 
Nice. Uh, yeah, this is again a uh, Tarbuck vindication post because <laughs> uh, Kate comes to the realization that, okay, no, there is no clean dividing line throughout the Nero chart. Uh, some flow is channeled through uh, the impossible gap. Oh, Carla is um, heading out. Yeah. So uh, you were right, or Time Cake changed his mind. It's not really clear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you yeah yeah do you want to describe the chart yeah or... all right so you have a in the middle you have a kind of like a grid almost that goes at like in the lateral side it's it's really like crinkly with bunches of little bits it's kind of like it's kind of like if you took like a filled tetris board and you only highlighted the lines between the blocks and then you used bigger and bigger blocks as you went down the chart and then as you went to the from the left to the right, you just like added a blur filter and mm-hmm. and like glow and stuff. So you have like big messy uh, glowing pipes on the right, and on the left you have sharp uh, thin lines. And you you do have arrow you do have arrows coming in from the right and arrows going out at the bottom. Yeah. If you want to refresh on what this means, rewatch the last episode about uh, the dendritic emergence post by Time Cake. Like this is what this is an addendum to, and it's why that why is there this structure of stuff coming in from the impressionistic side, being channeled up to human calculator, and then going back down? What is the structure facilitating that, and why is there a gap in the middle? And this is the chart he came up with um, through the higher density of. Um, channels let's say uh in the top left corner most of the flow will be channeled necessarily from there because um it just becomes fewer and fewer wires as you go downwards so when stuff is channeled from the uh from the right side it most flows up and then back down uh to escape into the paradigm like what is channeled in is uh sensation implicit learning all that good shit it's channeled up then back down and emerges into the paradigm. I think, the, yeah, I think important, to dendritic emergence. I, I think an important thing when you're looking at the chart, though, is that 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 circuit that you just described of it, like going up and going down. In this version of of the chart, in the uh, emergence of flow structure, that kind of like looping structure isn't isn't there anymore. It, no, uh, it, yeah, it like it says that in one of the notes. What I just explained, like mm-hmm. by by there being just more connections further up, when something just comes in from the side, most of the flow will be channeled up there. Yeah. Some will just go immediately down and mm-hmm. just emerge downwards, but most will go upwards because there are more channels. Yeah, and then it must go back down. So. There is no hard cut, it just still shows why most of the flow in society would go to the mm-hmm. corner, or at least flow skews towards the corner before going back down. Yeah. And it also seems to like um acknowledge my idea of most of the information isn't it's no longer just coming in from the bottom right of the chart. It's all it's coming in from the entire rightmost edge of the chart and spilling inwards that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, see I mean, I thought that was what we all agreed on. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what we all agree yeah. on, but that's, okay. that was implied yeah. to okay. not be so, how... Some people might have been wrong earlier. Yeah, it, it, it's implied that that may not be how Time Cake thought of it at the time. Yeah. And uh, it seems like mm. he's coming around to the right side, a.k.a. my side. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I want I like, to... Um, I like how it gets, like, thicker and blurrier on the edges. I mean, that sort of, like, gets at the... The, like bigger chunks right. and like stickiness that I was talking about earlier, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like just stuff kind of blurs together. It's the whole idea that these concepts have to kind of be codified. The yeah. vibes first. You gotta chew on it. You gotta something. digest yeah. it. It's gotta go through the neuro stomach. Okay. <laughs> the neuro stomach. But there's, there's one really interesting note here on the post, which is. The volume of flow is generally more than the overall network can handle, so a large fraction of it is siphoned off to the quote-unquote periphery. So, like, this is the neurotype. This is where society is. What is in the periphery? Yeah. Are there 
the dark Aren't gods. Aren't they ghosts? Like, if there's more info coming in, being extracted, than is coming out because there's an overflow. Something is siphoned off through this desert that lies outside. Like, flows leading to the desert, that sounds like, like the Lowe's fucking schizophrenia thing. Or we could say that this is, this is where fucking ghosts go. This is where all the axes of, so, uh, of social no, production it, goes. It exists outside of, like... It's where the dark gods uh, reside. In right, the it's where the dark gods reside. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. th- there is stuff, there is cultural production which dwells somewhere outside of society. And that's a, that's a terrifying note to have on here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe the Earth is a big brain, and that's where it goes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And speaking of the Earth being a big brain, we have this ace of a comment from Gigroot here. Mm. Um, did everybody take a look at that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Which oh, yeah. One? yeah. It's short enough that I can read it out, but it'll be on screen. Uh, basically, his, his criticism is, look, this model is really cool looking and all, but... You're trying to describe this as how ideas propagate through a society, and it looks like you just made a pretty chart instead that's no longer trying to describe anything in reality. Hmm. Like, uh, like what? Okay. Like, like it's it's gone so far in the metaphorical that it seems like at least to gig root here, it's no longer like describing anything anymore. Like, are we like? Basically, he's challenging the idea that this is even really how information flows through a population or through a person. Right. Yeah. Mm. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about that with the next post, but I guess I can put it here, mm-hmm. which is I, th- I think we're arriving at a very clean split between Reed's vision for neurotyping and Time Cake's vision for neurotyping. I think this is the dichotomy. We have a choice between... Do you do we just want to solve this? Do we want to have a clean cut, simple little system that we can explain easily? Or do we just want to dig deeper beyond the point where it is obviously intended within the system? Do we just want to layer shit on there, make it more complex, just take this as far as it can go and further? Cake is the second, read is the fir- the first, obviously. And um yeah, I really don't care if this exists in society. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, yeah it, it absolutely is cool. And, like, especially after having done the homework uh, of looking at his previous chart, Dendri- Dendritic Emergence, I and, feel uh, like I understand. Fair, I don't think we have gotten that far yet. I think this mm-hmm. very much still exists in society. Yeah, I could I mean, say I could be convinced that something like this kind of exists in society. Yes, this just it, looks it has like not the, yet lost all verisimilitude. This just looks like the last one, but in more detail. So I don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. It still seems uh, like like you. Could, I feel like you could still like chop this up into sixteen squares and say that this is the best representation of what it's like to be me. Like you can still hmm. do useful things with this. So it hasn't completely abandoned the it, like we're not off the map, even if we yeah. are all right, right. We're not off the page, even if we are off the map. There we go. That's what it's I was just like to. the it's just like the veins under the chart that's already there. Yeah. Yeah. In so. fact, these these are the veins under the chart. Yeah. You can feel yeah. them beating if you press against the back of your right. skull. Th- this very is warm. the blood flowing through neurotyping. <laughs> <laughs> it spills out into the paradigm. <laughs> Where it is gulped down by us all. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drink the blood. Mm-hmm. Ignorant Drink fools the that we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got your, your big arteries over here and you got your big little capillaries <laughs> over there. That's that's how it goes. Yeah. Suck down that blood, dear listener. <laughs> <clears throat> this is tasty. So so like I kinda want there to be like more in this direction i want to go i, I kind of agreed with oro now like i want to go beyond this i want to like lose grip with the world entirely and just like yeah. follow this in away beyond the clouds right like this is what neurotyping this is what any personality metrics is good for it just gives you interesting ideas and if those <laughs> interesting ideas at some point no longer describe personality that's fine. Who the fuck cares? You're having interesting ideas. Isn't that all that matters? Yeah. Hmm. 
Well, I don't think I have too much to say on it. Um, like oh, it seems... I can say that I did not read Time Cake's response, like, even slightly. I tried. <laughs> like, I tried, but the... I ran out of time, and also, like, I couldn't do it. The very first paragraph of his is, with regards to your concerns about the applicability of a fluid flow applying to the reality of information, flow through a network, it seems your concerns were correct. Fluid flow isn't the optimal analogy for modeling information. <laughs> And in the second paragraph, he has a link to a relevant paper, right. which is also quite why, extensive. Why would he care if this thought flow through this paradigm Holy mimics shit. a liquid? That's just a side note on the post. We can all imagine that th these wires lead something somewhere. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck cares if it maps onto fluid dynamics? <laughs> yeah. Hey, this is neuropipelining. I, I was trying to think of anything more relevant <laughs> <laughs> it's a barely useful metaphor for understanding a chart which is really just describing itself instead of like it, it, the chart isn't trying to describe water it's trying to describe information yeah mm -hmm. exactly it, it's an impressionistic description of what fluid flow is fluid right. flow that i feel like that's redundant but i kind of don't care because it's fun to say uh yeah Timecake had an imp thought, and like an analyst, he immediately apologized and went on a rant about how it's <laughs> technically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, next post. Sure. Imps and catagargoyles, yeah. The, 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 sh the, the oh, yeah, two yeah. shoulder demons uh, of, of the thinking person. Uh, read me 55, uh, 45. Uh, yeah. Mm. Random linear this and lateral one. thinking theory, or a video called Neuro Theory Two: The Grid. The Grid. The grid. Yeah, this is that hex one I was talking about on one of the other episodes. Yeah, it's just so nice. It's so very nice. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's like a honeycomb type deal. Mm -hmm. um, and for linear thinkers, they're basically going from the center thought, the center topic, I guess, um, and straight to the adjacent uh, ones. These are like relevant points to that central topic. Um, but if you get more lateral, you start doing these um, seemingly random jumps to further away combs. Um, you're like skipping over a few. You know, they're still connected in some way. It's just like a few layers removed. Um, and then there was the thing about uh, lexicals being able to maybe explain this. Like, oh yeah, I went from this to this to this. And then impressionists, not so much. That gets elaborated on, like, in the comments, kind yeah, of. Yeah, time cake in the comments. But right. yeah, I, I really like how this is like a, a neat little video on summary of the thing we talked about last episode with the mm -hmm. peripheral of thoughts and how far they are away from what you're currently thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew someone else had put that somewhere, but apparently it was in the very next episode. So I am an idiot for <laughs> having it brought up beforehand. <laughs> oh, well. Um, yeah, no, it's exactly that. Like, how far do you jump away? How out of the way is the solution? Mm -hmm. so you are the solutions you first consider. Um, yeah, yeah, and and as this idea develops, it's like, um, and you can see discussion of this in the comments that the laterality is is like a RAM esque search space, and the the different layers of hexagons around the outside is really just to describe like the total dis the total space of possible thoughts that you're searching for things in and mm -hmm. like i, I kind of like the idea that a categorical person might have a better account of how they got from one thought to the next and are able to trace their path back to you but i don't think it's true it would just be cool if it i think was. that's just being smart <laughs> right yeah like he ends the video on a note of well yeah um also uh Lexical people can explain how they got some random scans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, from from the people that I know who have had uh, who have talked to me about their anxiety, I wouldn't know firsthand because I'm immune to such things. But uh, right. from the people Lucky who have you. told me about it, uh, apparently it's like you have a bunch of threads in your brain that are like like are processing threads that are like constantly like injecting noise 
about other things that you should be worried about and they are trying very hard to convince you of why you should be afraid of this thing or or what uh-huh. you should worry about and there's this big uncertain space and it's, it's like it's it's like it's misfiring but mm-hmm. when like we it's... when i talk to the, one of those people and i try to like like try to uncover where their thoughts are coming from they can actually just trace through the line of where it goes and it seems like linearizing it helps them to like see where the uncertainty is and deal with it in a concrete way Uh Uh so i guess maybe anxiety is like a like a misfire in the lateral system Hmm. does that sound right to you yeah i'm immune to anxiety so i don't know like thought i guess it's kind of a loop in which you get stuck and loops are just harder to get when you're thinking linearly Mm-hmm. It's, I think just generally loops to get stuck on are more of a lateral phenomenon. Right. So you have all these like unresolved uh, things like further in your periphery, just kind of mm-hmm. uh, doing their thing. Now, not to say that the 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 uh, sh- thought shape that I described just now is inescapable. Like talking to the to these highly lateral but anxious people has enabled them to uh, identify when they get into these loops and. They get used to how to break it, and so it like, like like tracing over your thoughts like this and identifying why you thought of certain things. It 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 does help you to eventually stop being so anxious. It, it it's like, um, you become resistant to catching yourself in those or to putting yourself in those loops, and it makes the whole laterality mm. thing more efficient. Which just yeah. it, it I'm convincing myself the more I talk that, that this is a misfire in the lateral system. Yeah. I think yeah. the way I usually deal with it is to like sort of uh try and like reset it by like going into that like linear zen kind of zone hmm. and then just like kind of come back up, just like start the thoughts over again. Like uh yeah, just reboot the laterality. Gotcha. Um, reboot fixes everything, yes. Cool. Yeah. Have you tried turning it off? No, okay. <laughs> turn your brain off. Right. <laughs> turn your brain off and on again. Uh, oh, oh, you didn't like ever? Have you tried rebooting your laterality? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. That's the title of the episode. What is? <laughs> you tried rebooting your laterality. <laughs> yeah, Was that a good. bad program? Mm. I also like the charts and egg again, but yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's also good. Um, <laughs> probably going with this one, yeah. I think the okay. illustration in the middle of the video, uh, where he talks about like here's a thought in the middle, and then it like plunges outwards linearly to search for an idea, is a is a really good um, illustration of what linearity is in my mind. Yeah. Mm. Let's see. Uh, uh, did you did you look at the uh, grid theory elaboration in uh, yeah, the time? Yeah, I, I want to get. I just want to get to time cake's fucking massive chart. He posts that <laughs> elaboration. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So. Oh, I didn't even uh, see this. It, it starts the same way. Like you have your center square. You have a search space defined by laterality, and in that you jump two points. Well. On average, be further out if you're more lateral, but on average, be further in if you're more uh, linear. But then there are an impressionistic mode and a lexical mode of dealing with that. The lexical mode does not expand the search space, rather it will jump to different spaces within it, and then connect them solidly by bridges. Just have a set link between these categories, like a set thought that connects them, and you keep jumping to more things and um keep reinforcing and connecting these uh yeah adjacent tiles mm-hmm. until you have a whole idea and according to time cake that's kind of suboptimal because the ideal path might lie outside the search space which you aren't expanding and also you might get stuck because you enforce these connections mm-hmm. whereas for um more impressionistic thinking you do not form these kind of bridges you just keep jumping from the spaces and you have to limit your search space in some direction um ideally you would um restrict going in one direction in which there are less connections and only expand into the direction where there are more interconnections which would probably lead you to the correct or 
uh, most fruitful train of thought. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you will randomly still build like a bridge between two nodes which are very far away from your original thought. So this connection, this side node, comment, whatever, will seem completely random and very um, and connected to the conversation to a more lexical thinker. So we're playing Battleship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Battleship was going to be my explanation of it. Le the the like jump around, shoot around kind of thing. The explanation. The explanation. Mm. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you say that by accident. <laughs> yeah. All right. So does this speak truth to you? Mm, sure. <laughs> Like does this thing does bit. this seem like an accurate like given that we all like the previous one of the jumping around yeah. um the, the the one from the video uh do we like this expansion on it I I get what he means and I think these uh enforced con yeah these enforced connections between ideas are probably more of a lexical thing and the behavior of um, just having one of those somewhere outside, just in a conversation coming at, uh, coming up with very lateral people, uh, completely divorced from the original topic, just, oh, these two things are related, which are way far from that. That's a thing that happened. That's a thing I've seen happen. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, parts of this ring show, I don't, I don't have a solid, uh, image and i don't think it's quite true that you just say oh the, the search space can expand like infinitely and you're just like cutting off the corner maybe where there are less connections i don't know how that would work and it, it seems untrue it seems like it would open up impressionism mm -hmm. for just way more sprawling possibility than even uh like lexical uh lexical highly lateral thinking like at this point why does the um why does the definition of the original search space as defined by laterality still matter if uh, lexicals are restrained to that and impressionists can just keep going infinitely wide? Yeah, that's what like, I was going to say. It, yeah. it seems like this conflation of um, categoricalness and impressionism with linearity and laterality is like, like you're crossing the streams, man. Like, like yeah. you're you're turning one into the other this is right. this is what a 90 degree flip looks like <laughs> uh yeah especially since what time cake describes uh explicitly here is uh convergent thinking as lexicality and divergent thinking as impressionism which we previously had as linearity and laterality by yeah. other people this, so. this is mm -hmm. what a folding chair looks like <laughs> you took the axes and folded this them is together. what a beehive looks like <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think it's like maybe true in moderation. Mm. Like Yeah, as I said, I think there are true <laughs> ideas in there. I don't think I don't think this as a whole is like a a good image. You have to pick and choose. Right. Well like I feel I think like that I can a do that a word has a bunch of extra baggage attached to it. You know? Like yeah. <clears throat> so when you get an idea and you word that idea um, you're likely to pull up a, a cluster. So instead of jumping around to a single hex, you would jump around to like a like a cluster of three or like a like a little star of six. That's or like, like that. hmm. that's like strike three for the big chunks thing that I'm talking about. Yeah, it's like you're, you're it's like you're going fishing or something. Chunks. You're just like Ag again, read us <laughs> the whole peanut. <laughs> <laughs> you're like throwing your harpoon out there. And you might like miss a bunch of times, but yeah. you might like, I don't know. Hit, you might catch a hit, fish. Yeah. You might say yar and have a good time. <laughs> it, it's thinking with portals versus fishing with dynamite. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's also a good episode title. <laughs> I wonder which one we're going to go with. I have uh, no both. idea. Those, those are both them excellent. Yeah. Find a way to squish them together. Maybe we'll do uh, one maybe, of those like maybe I'll do a wing. poll. Maybe I'll do a poll and ask people. I want to do one of those Rocky and Bullwinkle style intros where where like it's one or the other, and like and like mm. the sign flips and stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Or am I the only person so old that I care about Rocky and Bullwinkle? 
I do know what that is, and I know that bit. <laughs> okay. You're, you're that was apparently really common in naming and stuff like that, like um, Frankenstein or yeah. the modern Prometheus. The modern Prometheus, it, yeah. Mm. It's a it it's a holdover familiar. from from that era of double titling literature and stuff like that. Yeah. It's not an Alice in Wonderland at some point. Probably. It's like how you have to have multiple names for each neurotype: one for impressionists to get, and one for lexicals to get. Yes. <laughs> so too should you title books uh did anybody else besides me look at this not a ninja quote or uh post you have to kind of dig for it uh, in the comments if you go the one into that the... starts with i think i understand what this chart means or... yeah yeah that one yeah uh no i had not i think uh, i understand well, what this chart i read means. all of them i just didn't get anything from it gotcha um I'm just going to read the whole thing from here. I think I yeah, understand sure. what this chart means. If I were to summarize, they're saying that once someone has thought of a, has a thought that's more distant from the central thought, a more lexical thinker will secure that thought in their mind by thinking through all the in-between thoughts that they may have initially skipped, while a more impressionistic thinker won't bother to secure that connection and will simply let that possib possibly distant thought become the new central thought without really thinking about how it connects to the original central thought. The, what's being proposed here is that when you make a jump, do you build a bridge back to your original thought or yeah. not? This this is kind of the thing I was trying to describe in that one episode, which I thought that one guy meant with thought to conclusion, uh, well, reasoning to conclusion to conclusion to reasoning. <laughs> this is kind of that again. This I mean, seems like I... a more defensible version of what you seem to have meant yeah, at, that, at that time. This is what I... I, I relate more strongly to this than what that other post said. Like, I feel like this is what I was trying to say. Yeah, this is a thing that can happen to me. Like, I'll just, mm. uh, mm. I'll, I'll find myself at a very different topic a few minutes later. I'm like, oh, wait, wasn't I mm. talking about ants like five minutes ago? Yeah. How did I get here? Yes, exactly. The how did we get here <laughs> is, is perfect. Um,. I, I also really don't like the idea that he brings up, that um, Time Cake brings up in his chart expansion, which is that like impressionism is a form of pre consciousness. Like, like that just sounds. I mean, didn't you say that all these processes are pre conscious? I guess kind of, but the idea of lex lexical, like what I got from what he was saying is that lexicalizing thing is moving it from the pre conscious to the conscious as you're doing oh, okay. it. Um, I might I, just I be wrong that. there, but it, it that I mean, I I guess it only is on that one side of the chart, so mm -hmm. maybe he means that it's only the impressionism. But in that case, yeah, that's that's a bit silly. It I gets under my skin a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I took it as all these connection building things are just this is how you come to have a thought. The thing you're thinking consciously, it's still just that thought. You don't choose to draw these connections mm -hmm. but maybe he's implying that these solid bridges that lexicals do are actually conscious mm -hmm. in that case i disagree hmm. yeah all right um shall we do the next read me post uh yeah sure yeah um wait no this is magic colors uh quote unquote nonsense read me 45 okay this is where and it's uh it's uh, Roman Romantic, Neuro Theory 3, quote-unquote nonsense. Okay, mm -hmm. I didn't have time to get to and this one, but I think... I, I had in the back of my mind that there was going to be a, a real post for the uh, prep goth nerd jock post, yeah, but I didn't skip it, and I was right. This is it. This was the thing I was searching for, so mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad we didn't explain it in full or talk about it in full. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's probably some some better vibe that you could hone in on other than goth to mean the top right. Although I do, mm. like, if you draw a line from normies in the exact middle out to goth, I it, the way that it passes through my square feels feels correct to me for my placement. Mm. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not, like full eyeliner and black and stuff but i do right. have a certain fascination with uh ropes and chains and so and that kind of stuff that's that's pretty cool yeah. so is uh so is mesh as though that has any fucking thing to do with <laughs> new types 
<laughs> New types like I mean, mesh. That's what we're getting at. Here. Oh, this is not about personality, but still, we can see these cultures through the lens of, uh, well, I'm thinking stuff and I'm not going to explain it, and it's more of a vibe or it's more mm-hmm. codified. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and and here we get again back down back to your idea of solve or keep digging. Does it yeah. matter how much it applies to reality anymore? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, have we lost this essentially, plot? if if you just want neurotyping explained to you, if you just want a simple understanding of how you could see lexical and impressionism and that reality and linearity, you could probably watch this video and feel like you have figured it out. Like, mm-hmm. read me does a good job explaining shit. That just doesn't feel very satisfying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I want it to be meaty. Right, yeah. And I weird. don't want it simplified. That's the opposite of what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some problems with this with this video though. Like he he talks about how uh what happens when when two you put two neurotypes to, uh neurotypes. When you put two new types together, do they have a hard time communicating with each other or not? And like That depends. Uh, yeah, I always thought that the consensus or, or like the the average experience of people is that Preshies can talk to each other just fine most of the time. And it, and it's it's cross chart communication that's like really hard. That's where so many misunderstandings come from, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I do think like the video still implies that cross chart communication is harder, but that still conversation between two lexicals would be easier than conversation between two <laughs> Preshies. I mean, I've had um, uh, the experience when I first got onto the Neurocord and talked to uh, Jelly and Snail. They were the first two people I talked to. Um, I think it did take me a bit to, like, get their particular language. Mm. So mm. I did feel alienated at first. So I think in that way, like, you know, you can develop your different kinds of impressionistic talking and communicating. Okay, let's let's frame this through everyone's favorite Japanese colloquialism. Let's talk about anime. <laughs> so, I, if if I remember correctly, um, Digi typed uh, both Sato and Masaki from NHK as new types, and they're sure not communicating effectively. I wouldn't know. Even though they do a lot of that, they do a lot of talking, and they don't get the point across to the very end. Mm. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe that's true. Gotcha. I I do think that would probably be easier for two lexicals in the same square to communicate than for two impressions in the same square to communicate. But still, both of these are a lot easier than cross chart communication. Yeah. So I'd I'd agree to a weak w- version of that. Mm. I like the claim that like the left half of the chart, these people, they make sense. <laughs> and I, I know that what he means is make sense in the conventional yeah, yeah. in the conventional way. Makes sense to others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh makes conventional sense. And that that kind of idea seems to like reinforce the the digi perception of the chart, which is uh like uh right is good and up is good. So the ideal person is a new type. <laughs> hmm. I did it. <laughs> Okay, I, I want to talk about a comment, mm-hmm. which is the time cake one, which is just the culture cycle, essentially. It's both time cake's flowchart throughout society, and it's this, with Reed explaining how the dynamic between goth nerds, um, preps, joss, mm-hmm. etc. works. So, step one, the goths try things that don't make sense. Step two, the nerds try to make sense of what the goths are doing. Three, the preps take what the nerds are doing and make it into a new reference point for what makes sense. Four, the jocks act out that which makes sense, although imperfectly, since they aren't as concerned with the strict adherence to what makes sense as the preps are. These uh, Five, these imperfections are a part of what provides the gist for the mill that the goths try out. Um, and the cycle continues. So what I get from this is... Um, First, you have um, you have like diffuse art. You have cool artsy like art house shit uh, in cinema or something. 
that yeah. then before becomes formalized. Like people draw from that like uh tropes and nerdy obsessions with neat little um neat little details. Mm -hmm. Like stuff that they would then look for in media. Uh, well, the first is the the golf shit. The first is just the diffuse art. The second, like taking out small parts of that, doing like um you tap on cubes and all that, like small little aspects and archetypes from this uh, diffuse art. And that's the nerd shit. That's then the latlax. And then that flows back into the culture. You have these incredibly complex uh, comic book whatever stories, which are that second, the nerd part, which then becomes part of the cultural paradigm, becomes part of the the preppy, the bookkeeperish. oh, like Marvel movies and shit. Mm -hmm. Every, everyone knows those. Those are normal. And then this notion of normalcy, like the general vibe of superheroes, whatever, a general cultural paradigm is then channeled back through the jocks who, ju uh, through the jocks who just act within that. And their acting within it is then uh, a part of uh, like the human condition, which would then be rechanneled into the diffuse art and the circle continues. Hmm. So the goth nerd prep jock cycle is actually based and not even just a meme and this is really true yes and yes, uh, this is i was true. wrong the whole like, time right time cake and read <laughs> describe the same thing read uh no time cake is just more pretentious about it mm -hmm. this is right <laughs> and as somebody who spends most of my time around pretentious people that really speaks to right. me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I, I, as I someone feel... whose main character quality is being pretentious it does I feel like I've been given a revelation this day that, like, mm. as always, the memes were serious the whole time, and actually yeah. it was real all along. It's Th like... There is no meaningful distinction between theory posts and shit posts. It's like, <laughs> it's like finding out that actually there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I... Th this post right here redeems the uh the dendritic emergence cycle to me entirely like all of the okay. problems that i had with it is brought home by this meme shit post it's the best <laughs> this is the ideal experience i i'm i don't even think this is shit post yeah i think he means this. oh no i i think he means I, it too i agree yeah it just like you know it looks like a shit post <laughs> that's what i'm saying yeah, yeah. that's the stuff it yeah. is yeah uh, reed's comment to this is just very interesting elaboration one up vote. yeah but like this is perfect yeah Th like this is the cycle that just a few posts ago i was complaining about not existing ah <laughs> uh, i'm i am uplifted it does yeah. exist in reality this is wonderful this is delightful. Um. <laughs> no, you know wow. what it feels like? It feels like Santa Claus finding out that the anthropomorphic M and M's are real. They do <laughs> exist, and then he falls you know, over and faints because he's he's just like crushed under the weight of the realization. His world is shattered. His mind is in pieces, trying to reassemble themselves into a beautiful mosaic. Right, yeah. Santa Claus is so shocked by the realization that he himself does not exist that he has to be brought back by the faith of the M&Ms into <laughs> him. So, yeah, fuck it. I, I don't even care about this tangent. <laughs> I did have one other it... thing to say about the flow. Um, mm -hmm. This, after the... Um, whichever episode that was with the dendritic emergence. Um, mm -hmm. Last I think, episode. I think it was Scroy that said there was like something about like comedy like a diagonal line from like uh human calculators to pure instincts and i was like wait mm -hmm. a minute mm -hmm. that's like that dead area where like you're caught in both sides of the stream yeah 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 so you're like taking both sides and uh that's and, where the most oh, i mean objective yeah. I mean, jokes comedy come is from. a coping mechanism you just have to deal with not being on either side of the stream <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. it's it's a trans comedy is a translatory action uh, not between what is accepted and what must be said, but between uh, the coding and decoding uh, currents of the stream throughout society. Okay. All right. So now to a different kind of post. It's another overseer post. I didn't yeah. read any of this. I don't care. 
the type <laughs> most predisposed to talking about itself. I mean, I didn't have time. I like got home. I have like one hour to do stuff. Hey, no worries, man. <laughs> so this this post Why introduces the this? ideas of uh, neurotyping dead zones. There being a dead zone of impressionism, which is the purple column. It's just people who are uh, just too just too impressionistic to like easily communicate with people, but not quite so impressionistic that it's impossible to do so. So they're in this. Like, they're constantly being edged. They, <laughs> they cannot... <laughs> they have this constant frustration that, like, they could. If if they only put the effort in, they could communicate. But it's mm. just so fucking hard. And they're an overseer. They're a sad boy. They don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and similarly, they have a dead zone of laterality, which is uh, the second to top column, like the aesthetician to technician column. Uh, I don't know, that's Call like the zone uh, I've seen the most productive, row. though. Um, and I don't even get what they mean, like, why is that a dead zone? This isn't even well explained in here. Yeah, yeah they do nothing to convey to you that yeah. idea. So if it doesn't drive with you instantly, then yeah. you're just also, you're just stuck. Yeah, I can see yeah, purple, they also but just like... Say mm. this first part as a fact, like, they are just... They are just about lexical enough that they are still capable of communicating. Like, yeah, anyone beyond us is literally uh, incapable of communicating ideas. I love mm-hmm. that. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, so, man, I have a lot of problems with this. There, there's, <laughs> there's this weird idea in there that you can only understand people who are less lateral than you, like... Um, <sighs> they're probably the most good. potentially wordy. It, it, it like is also it's like, <sighs> look, dude, pick your poison. Like, is this yeah. is this the dead zone where you're unable to be, communicate or not? Right. And I I want to con- just more overseer is the suffering type. This mm-hmm. is just a lot of bullshit explanation for why they feel bad and why they feel misunderstood. Yeah, I think um, your life just sucks because I'm sitting pretty in this uh, in, in this square <laughs> that is supposed to be the square of suffering, and uh, I'm having a fine time, yeah. man. Yeah. Also, fucking overseers don't have the unique trait of wishing to be understood. That's like <laughs> a, a pretty pretty common human thing. I think. I, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and like, why is it? Why is it here? And not somewhere else. Why is it not uh, like on the corner from me? Why is it not the understandings that yeah. that have this experience? There's there's no substance underneath this. Yeah, Th- this just feels like self bias. So it's oh, mm-hmm. I feel misunderstood. So it must be because of these special conditions of where I are, uh, where I am. On I mean, side. it's it's self justifying because you get a you do get a bunch of overseers lamenting their own existence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in these posts so uh, like just from data you can see that that's that that's true ish but also i think maybe it's more like i don't want to be too uh impression equals feelings but you're in touch enough with your feelings and articulate enough that you can tell people about it so you're just the most likely to talk about your feelings um <laughs> from from that perspective but also, no, I don't think that. Yeah, also, that's just a bunch of sad people that digitype that way. So maybe it was just people typing themselves. Oh, I relate to these guys. Yeah. But mm-hmm. not because I think like them, but because I'm also sad. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a nice comment by Read Me under this, which is, um, oh, you have to, um, like, this post emerged from a discussion amongst overseers in the mm-hmm. Discord. Like, what are common traits amongst us? And Read cautions that, well, typology communities just skew towards people who feel like they are kind of misunderstood because they wish to seek for a way to explain to others why they are a certain way yeah so probably uh anyone you talk to in there would be more likely to feel like society society doesn't get them dude they don't get it Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) um hot take you're not special. You're just not putting in enough effort. Just fucking talk to people. 
So, <laughs> yes, agree. People and on the note, on deep. the note of talking to people, do you think that like I, uh, I think I'm pretty wordy. I talk a lot. Uh, yeah. I think that's mm-hmm. mostly because I'm around people that talk a lot and loud mm. and are just willing to talk over you. Um, do you think there's that the um, overseer has the potential? Has they're probably the most potentially wordy. Do you think that's true? Um, I think it it might be true. I I'm, I'm mm. not completely opposed to the idea. I, f- I feel like there's this particular kind of wordiness. It's like diatribes or whatever. Yeah. Like, they'll just like, I feel like at certain points just go of, off about shit. Yeah, I feel like heart impressionists would be more easily upset by just not being uh, passed correctly so they just give up. That's certainly a thing which I have encountered on your type amongst like hard red column people. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I'm also sometimes a very wordy person. I just take my battles because I don't want to waste time. <laughs> yeah. When I do, um, it can be uh, very lengthy <laughs> in my explanations. Yeah, like um, you could argue that, like beyond the, like either more lateral or more impressionistic, are both like the give up zones. Hmm. The like, eh, yeah, shouldn't bother. That sounds possible. Yeah, like that's that's a pretty that's a pretty early on thought that I had about this actually. Yeah, that sounds sounds fine. I I think um, I, I ask this because like this idea of like me being at the perfect intersection of dead zones is the total opposite of what Digi herself said earlier in this episode, where she's like, the overseer is like at the perfect intersection of yeah, being right. impressionistic enough to be great and right. lateral That's enough to be Dick great. Is a good host. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you're great. You can either be really bad or really good. Yeah. Yeah. Dead zone. I think it's more like a life zone, if you think <laughs> if you get me. <laughs> I mean, okay, so I I do feel like people who, like when I'm talking and explaining something, and I'm explaining a particularly spicy take of mine, if they don't listen to the end of what I'm saying, they will often think that I believe a much worse thing than I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, like, um... It's got a certain... I'm reaching for an example, and one is just not coming to me right now, because we've been doing this so for two hours. It has, like, <laughs> a certain logic wrap around it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm okay like or or like um it'll sound like i mean something way more offensive than i actually (laughs) intended to be like uh when i'm crusading against um people taking pills for psychology reasons the whole uh pharmaceutical business um my real thought is like there if i can make you depressed by talking to you if i can put you in that emotional state by talking to you or by doing something to your life without touching you without touching your brain you should be able to do something like that that will get you out of that state so i don't think that reaching for drugs where we don't know what they do is necessarily the best option right away but you see how it sounds like i yeah. want no <laughs> one to take any any antidepressants ever like it or or I really think that if you're taking something and it is working for you, then just go ahead and keep doing that. I just want you to be realistic mm. about the possibility that it might not be working for you nearly as well as you think it is. Right. Yeah. But, like, I say a lot of things like that that sound really bad until I'm done talking. <laughs> 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 nice. Okay. I, I, I want to tie a nice little knot about both mm. this. Um the um uh the digi interview on the dick show and uh tabak's idea from earlier uh from an earlier episode that like the space increases with laterality like new type and human calculator are farther apart the more space in between them than between pure instinct and book- bookkeeper yeah hmm. um which is like in the dating discussion in the in the interview in the dick show thing mm-hmm. One thought I had, which I want to bring up there, is, like, the only people where I can see that they'd more date a person close to themselves are, like, high lats. Like, the fascinator-analyst combo 
seems good to me, and I can't really imagine a new type dating a human calculator. It seems like there's that's too much grounds for elation. Yeah, I feel like they would murder pretty each other. easily do that for a contemplative impressionist or a statistician technician. Mm-hmm. Like that, those work. It, it it just goes too far apart. There's just no not enough common ground anymore. So they have to move closer together. Mm-hmm. So I think for high lats, your ideal partner would probably be closer to you on the charts than if you're farther down. Yeah, Maybe. you've convinced me. I don't know. I feel like that's just like an unrelatability thing. Like there's a higher chance to be unrelatable to other people. (laughs) Wait, what What the fuck did I just say? You've convinced me of my own idea? (laughs) The fuck up you are. (laughs) Yeah, you did. (laughs) But I don't mean like in like the left or right. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Hmm. Okay. Um, Um... uh, so here's a great segue that's that's just come up is acting yeah. powers in the comments of this post um may, uh, has a real gem of a comment about chart subdivision yeah it, it's a concept that we've talked about defo- before which is like the the crystallization of each quadrant is the person who's the most in this in the extreme of it so like for the top right it's new types for the top left it's human calculators and all of that yeah mm-hmm. and that if you pick any two by two grid like any block of four that are all touching each other uh you'll get a a a repeat of that same idea in the chart yeah it's it's itself similar scale independent whatever yeah yeah i don't know where i didn't understand the impressionist uh square exactly Mm -hmm. until i realized that they are the jocks to the overseer nerd yes yeah yeah (laughs) That that works. They're the jocks yep. to the overseer nerd. Uh, if in of that little quadrant or quadrant of that little two by two block, the overseer is the human calculator of that group. The aesthetician yep. is the new type of that group. The externalist is the bookkeeper of that group, and the impressionist is the pure instinct of that group. And you can see yeah. this kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. repeat itself yeah, I, with I, any uh two by two that you might pick out uh, yeah uh, i do this all the time yeah so should we just go to that post yeah yeah okay i mean we're already uh cardinal convolution time cake yeah and <laughs> this is a mess. okay we have to explain this chart again. there's okay, quite a so, few configurations um, yeah he does exactly that thing Tavak just describes. He takes the uh, described, he takes the four corners of the chart and superimposes them. Uh, well, first he takes the two by two kernel. So just a little square comprised of four pieces, which has human calculators, new types, etc. Um, he puts that on the first so a two by two corner of the four by four square that is the neurotyping chart then on the um if we look at then on the middle of the top two rows then on the Uh right corner right upper corner and so on for all of them until it's completely filled then there's that again for a three by three kernel which is a three by three version of the chart where the corners are like the corner thirds are again uh the extreme types with the middle being uh translucent i guess in this case you could see it as and then the four by four kernel which is essentially trivial because it just puts the corners on the corners again which doesn't change anything if this sounds like complete fucking nonsense yeah it's look because at the it screen this is like impossible to discover. look at the screen now oh, and wow. then try to blame me for explaining it badly yeah you're not explaining it badly this is just like like it, it's resistant <laughs> to being explained yeah. visually or otherwise yes. okay well i'm not sure if this is unrelated or not but i've had this idea of sort of like there's sort of like rings of relatability from like a certain distance from you mm. i'm mm. sort of seeing that a little bit here Like, there might be types close to you that you can talk to easily, but then there might be this certain strip that is like, man, I really hate these people. But then beyond that, it's like, oh, they're fine. Yeah, like, um, 
so what you wind up with is it's the 16 by 6 or it's the 4 by 4 but each of them is is like made up of a patchwork of that's supposed to vaguely give you the percentages of what of the other roles they fill kind of <laughs> yeah. it it doesn't really make much visual sense the way that it's presented which is why uh what you're probably seeing on screen right now is my visual representation of it instead which i think is way clearer um hopefully i edit this clip and then export it and then shunt it over to the people to whom it matters to uh be able to recreate it themselves <laughs> sure um yeah a thing this uh superimposing the smaller version of the chart on the main chart reminds me of something that comes a lot later so this bit of foreshadowing which is neurionics which mm. also gives like your leaning as a two-letter combination with what is your primary type and then what is your leaning so someone who mm. is um i don't know in the institution square would be um like um oh it was abstract which is like the upper right corner um, new type being abstract abstract and aestheticians being um, instinct abstract which is like the pure instinct corner oh, of yeah. the mini square that is the top right corner of the neuro chart so it would be AI the combination so abstracting instinct this is the thing that XA made right those like triangles yeah right it's Axie's triangle thing okay yeah. that that sounds cool yeah <laughs> It sounds like a way to give, to to take this subdivision concept and convince human calculators that it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think Tolgi also worked on that, so mm, I think yeah. the human calculator thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> right on, right on. What we have like here is just like, you know, every permutation all at once, which like doesn't really make sense. Yeah. For understanding anything. <laughs> yeah. Also, since Tolg isn't here to bitch about that, like, uh, Tom Cake explains here that, oh, so we have these, um, four vector scalar ish things, which are the corners and how intense they are. So we could use a quaterion, which is a four dimensional space, uh, to describe it. And then in the comments, he goes about how he didn't succeed in doing that. And obviously he didn't. Like, <laughs> multiplying those to get minimal types is silly because multiplication doesn't really work in a quaterion. A, a quaterion is kind of... The important thing about it is that it's not uh, commutative, uh, commutative. It's uh, anti-symmetric. So A times B is the same as minus B times A. Yeah. Yeah, like, like it breaks so, symmetry in a way. Yes, it breaks and if you symmetry. Wanna, if... Multiplication here doesn't... Like, unless you want chart looping to be a necessary emergent quality. If you're wondering what the fuck we're talking about, imagine a ball, okay? Uh, Pizza ball. If you take one step to the east and then one step to the north, you'll wind up in a different place than if you take one step to the north and then one step to the east. Those are different positions on the yeah. ball. Or, or you could do this by rotating the ball, like it rearranging the the order of operations makes a difference as to yeah. where you wind up. Um, also, like a quaterion is explicitly a four dimensional space. So when he says like, "Oh, we could frame this as a quaterion," then that might imply some four dimensional structure. Yes, if you define a four dimensional space, and it implies four dimensional structure. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is the trees thing all over again. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, time cake obviously isn't a maths boy, so all this can be forgiven. I just I read this and was like, obviously this is not work. This is a bit silly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm wow. sure Tolgi would have more breath to bitch about it, but mm -hmm. yeah, time cake later realized in the comments why it didn't work, mm -hmm. and it's it's all fine. Um. The superimposition idea is cool, like we can, it kind of frames back into the um, low and high context culture. We can imagine a culture which is like more bookkeeper-ish and then the most, uh, the most lat um, in person in that society would not be the most lat in person that exists in general, 
but they would still be the new type of that society. They fill the same social role in that group as someone who is more lateral impressionist than them would be filling in the global society. So yeah, it's self-similar. You can take any subgroup and there would be there would always be a most lateral or a most linear and a most impressionist and a most lexical person and they would Yeah. Yeah, they could not know if they are the most extreme possible. If they don't have outside context. Yeah, that's where all the sad overseers fuzzy. come from. Is they have like really linear people all around them. Lloyd's like bookkeepers. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um yeah, I'm kind of wow. out of things to say on this one. I feel like yeah. I feel like in this case, my visual is probably going to do most of the talking for me on this one. Hopefully. Like, I feel like we've already explained it better. the The idea that Time K was trying to get at, we have explained better before even talking about that post. This image is way too complex for what it's saying. Yeah, it's just saying that small versions of the chart can be made out of the chart, and they would again seem like the whole chart if you're inside that. And don't have outside context. Yeah, but it's just not visually communicated in a coherent way. Yeah, it, it looks yeah, cool, just takes but all I the don't think the visual is useful. It's more confusing <laughs> than it's worth. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a show. Um, huh. uh, Carla left, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. The internet cut out. We, she, um, she left a while ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I noticed earlier. I just didn't want to pay attention to it to yeah. cut you off. Um, right. Yeah, but um, if you have found yourself, um, if throughout this conversation you have found yourself doubt smitten with doubt smite, um, <laughs> her channel is linked in the video description. Um, mm-hmm. If you're if you're starving for more new type content because you don't you for whatever reason just don't know where to get it. <laughs> her videos are great you should watch yeah. them yeah i'd recommend watching the giga vlogs they're great they're mm-hmm. nice introduction mm-hmm. or watch the new type rambles i guess they're more the more new typey yeah <laughs> or if you only care about music there's also the freestyle tapes going on if, if that's your cup of coffee your cup of tea that's the saying <laughs> yeah okay all right